thank you very much, um, and good afternoon, Mr. Toronto. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I haven't been here for about 25 years, and the city sure has changed. <laughs> uh, it, is, uh, it probably has the, the most parks per capita of any city in North America. You should be very proud to know. I want to thank um, Dave Harvey for being such a great host and for inviting me up here. Uh, the chair of Park People, uh, Julia Howell, and your terrific uh, Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Department under the direction of Richard Ovens. You really have a spectacular park system here. Uh, I was in, um, I took a little walk around um, with Dave, and we went to Sherwood Commons Park, and I found this <laughs> next to the hockey rink. And, um, <laughs> I'm going to bring this back to the United States. It's <laughs> And I'm going to um, introduce the U.S. hockey team to it. <laughs> I'm going to tell them that if you control this, you win the game. <laughs> um, but I digress. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about parks here, and we're going to talk about uh, you know what makes parks important. I work for a, a nonprofit, an NGO called the Trust for Public Land, and we work across the United States. And my job is to help cities make parks in a lot of different ways, parks and trails and greenways. Here's something about that. And there are a number of really interesting trends happening in parks, and I think you know that. Um, this is, I'm speaking to the uh, an enlightened audience here, uh, almost preaching to the converted, but they're, you know, they're really important for public health, as you know, and there's a public health crisis around the world. Um, they are really important for environmental sustainability. You can't really have a healthy environment without good parks. But um, I would also argue that there are um, keys for economic development cities, that they are essential to healthy communities, and that there's this essential thing that people sometimes forget about, which is really important, which is urban beauty. There's nothing more important than having beautiful parks. Uh, the Trust for Public Land works across the country. You can see in red there, those are the populated areas of the United States. And in fact, in the US, I don't know what it is in Canada, but in the U.S., 83% of Americans live in cities and nearby suburbs. It's been a profound transformation of where people live. And so uh, that also corresponds to where the Trust for Public Land has offices. And one of the things we do is we compare cities in the United States. We have something called Park Score. When you, uh, don't distract yourself now and try to do this with your iPad. But um, when you're done with this conference, you want to, you're noodling around, look up, you know, look up Park Score. And you can use this tool and compare American cities. And, we, we look at cities, and we look at five basic criteria, and then we rank them. How do they, how do these cities do, what kind of a job do they do providing parks for their citizens? And so the number one park city in America is not New York, but Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And if you look at this map, every neighborhood that's in light green, those people who live in that neighborhood live within a 10 minute walk of a park or a playground or a recreation area. The orange is a little bit dicey and red means, you know, it's, it's, it's a, there are, there are no parks within a 10 minute walk. So Minneapolis does really well, and it's not just the, the, the criteria include not just um, the 10 minute walk, which is the most important uh, piece of information, but also how much spending per capita, the number of playgrounds per thousand residents, the median park size, and then the final bit is the percentage of parkland, is a, the amount of parkland is a percentage of the city area. And Minneapolis does well across the board in those numbers. And then, to see a city that doesn't do so well, Fresno, California. Fresno, California is mostly in orange and red there. You can see that they, they spend very little money on parks and they have very few parks. And it's, you know, it's probably not a very livable city as a result. Um, and this is not to castigate California. Five of the top 15 park cities in America are in the state of California. So they do pretty well there. So what makes a strong community? I would argue that uh, you can't have a strong community without great parks, and I think you here in Toronto would agree with that because you have a great city and you have a great park system. In this um, little pastiche, you can see some kids um, in the upper left-hand corner. These are some kids in the Bronx planning their new school playground, and then on the top right, the children in Philadelphia, who, I'm sorry, Newark, New Jersey, who are involved in a community engagement process where they help design the park. On the bottom left, um, in, in Denver, Colorado, a park and community garden project, and then the bottom right, um, this great new park in Santa Fe, New Mexico, converting an old abandoned railroad yard into a park. 
Um, New Freedom Park really in Denver speaks volumes about the importance of parks to build a community. It's in a, com a community um, like Toronto, which has a lot of immigrants. Uh, I think they come primarily from Sri Lanka and from a country in South America that I can't remember. And these are three very different countries, but they have a common language, and the common language is the need for fresh fruits and vegetables and the desire to play soccer. And you put those three things together, and democracy flourishes in the creation of the new park. I mentioned parks and strong economies. Here's some facts and figures up on the screen for you. But um, it, the, the city of New York learned over the last few years that as you invest in parks, the investment you make in parks is really ends up being a fraction of the economic return. The people want to live and work and visit cities that have good parks, and the opposite is also true. If you have a, a bad or derelict park system, it becomes a place you really don't want to go to, and that's really what um, some cities look like and some cities, particularly you know, 20 and 30 and 40 years ago, look like. But there you can see some of the results of some of the studies we've done, uh, including a study for the city of Chattanooga in Tennessee. And the, the Volkswagen company decided to locate their manufacturing plant there, their North American manufacturing plant. They created uh, almost 3,000 direct jobs and 11,000 related jobs and half a million dollars in economic impact. But the, the, the um, Volkswagen CEO said it was the sort of natural beauty and the outdoor recreation opportunities that caused this European company to want to locate its manufacturing plant in Chattanooga. Um, parks uh, in New York have not always been great. There may be some of you in the audience um, who remember what the park system in New York looked like 40 years ago. I certainly remember. And this is a, an article from the New York Times uh, from 1980 documenting the terrible decline of a once great park system. And it really was terrible. Um, and it started, uh, the, the first public-private partnership for parks was actually preceded the efforts to save Central Park. And this was on Park Avenue where what used to be an open train cut was originally, was eventually covered over with a, a series of small parks. And then the neighbors across the street raised the money to pay for the plantings and became the first significant um, model of people getting private dollars to help a, a public amenity. But the probably the more prominent one, the one you many people would know about, you would know about, is the, the rescue of Central Park from a real terrible state of decline. And how terrible, this is what Central Park looked like when I was a teenager. So this is Central Park in the 1970s. It's up in the North End, it's a place known as the Harlem Mirror. This is a beautiful old uh, former boathouse that had turned into a disco and then set on fire by the owner when he couldn't make money. And it just sat there. And it was hard to believe that throughout Central Park, which was sort of the city's flagship park, um, there were abandoned buildings covered with graffiti and um, drained lakes full of garbage. And that's what, the, that's what Central Park looked like. So if you imagine what Central Park looked like, um, that's what the rest of the park system looked like. And that's the park system I knew as a teenager. It's hard to imagine it would ever recover. And then along came this idea of um, having putting one person in charge of the park. Uh, that they did, they appointed the administrator of the park back in the late 70s. <clears throat> and that person created, uh, worked with um, non-profit um, sort of civic leaders uh, who cared about the city, and they created something called the Central Park Conservancy, a nonprofit, to be a partner with the city. So they, the Central Park administrator, who's also the president of the Central Park Conservancy, reports both to the public, that was that is to the Parks Commissioner and the Mayor, and also to this nonprofit board. So this is what the Sheep Meadow looked like in the 1970s. Um, and people played softball and soccer there and had big events, but it was, it was bare dirt and rocks, and it was pretty terrible. And then um, they created the Park Ranger program, and that Park Ranger there giving directions is me. <laughs> that really is, it's not a joke. Um, and one of my first jobs was just to go and stand and guard this big new green lawn that they turned into the Sheep Meadow. So the sheep meadow was restored, but the key was you had to have someone there to explain very dip diplomatically to uh, New Yorkers who are often not diplomatic why you could no longer play touch football there. So you now have this spectacular public space, beautifully restored, and it's, uh, it's not well advertised, but if you go visit Central Park today, it's completely taken care of by a nonprofit organization, which raises about $30 million a year in private donations. It gets a, a small management fee from the city but it has a contract with the city of New York to run Central Park. And the park is spectacular. And that gave rise to a whole bunch of 
uh, Conservancy, so um, almost like something biblical. The Central Park Conservancy begat the Prospect Park Alliance, which begat the Battery Conservancy and then the Greenbelt Conservancy. And some of them are big and well healed with lots of very wealthy donors, and some are relatively small and have very little money that they raise, but they have you know, wonderful volunteers and they do really great things to, to bring attention to the park. And so there are about a dozen major conservancies now in, in New York City. And some of them are for specific parks and some of them like the Historic House Trust are for historic houses across the city. And there's the City Parks Foundation which does programming in underserved neighborhoods for sports programming for youth and arts and performing arts for, for people. Um, there's another model. The, uh, just like Central Park, Bryant Park, right in Midtown behind the main public library. The pictures on the top show what it looked like in the 1970s. Those are relatively benign looking, but Bryant Park was mostly known as a place where you could go and buy any drug that you wanted, uh, illegal drugs that is, and you could get mugged while you were buying the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad for business, but um, it was really bad for business in a big way. This was the very epicenter of Midtown in the Central Business District. There was a park that you were afraid to go into. And a different model was created, uh, something called a Business Improvement District. You have something here very similar, a Business Improvement Association. But the, for, for the first time, this model was applied to a public park. And the park was gradually restored, and it's now completely run by this Business Improvement District. There are no city tax dollars that go into it. Rather, there are a small amount of assessments on the neighboring um, commercial businesses, and then the revenue that's earned in the park with a restaurant and cafe and, and holiday markets and so on goes to support the park's operations. So, so that bottom view is just people on an average work day. They come out and there's movable, movable chairs. They come out from their offices or their bike messengers and they stop there and they have lunch and sit in chairs on this beautiful lawn. And then they have a free skating rink that goes up every winter. Um, and you can go there and skate for free. But I'm gonna bring the park there, yeah. Um, this is Madison Square Park what it looked like about 15 years ago. Again, a very major sort of uh, business community with major corporations across the street. But not, you know, not particularly good looking. The people who, lit, who worked in those buildings didn't use the park. It was kind of run down and the, the, the neighboring buildings and some of the restaurant owners got together with the city and said, look, we're willing to pony up a certain amount of money um, to fix up the park. We'll even raise a $5 million endowment to operate it if the city will team up with us. And, they did, and the park has been beautifully restored. It's run again by a conservancy. Uh, the a restaurateur named da Danny Meyer invented something called the Shake Shack, and the, the profits from this cafe, this Shake Shack restaurant, go into the park. And um, it's very popular morning, noon, and night, and even in the wintertime, people line up to get the, the burgers and shakes there. Similarly, at Union Square, which is a very important um, place in New York City, particularly for expressions of um, Political expressions, uh, Union Square, unfortunately, like a lot of other uh, places in the 1970s, it was a scary place. There were crimes and murders. And, uh, the first Earth Day was celebrated there, I think it was 1972. And then um, the city got together with a local business improvement district, and a farmer's market was launched there, which became the most popular farmer's market in the city there four days a week. And this is what Union Square looks like now. It was restored, reactivated. And I like to refer to Union Square as the Times Square for New Yorkers. So tourists go to Times Square and New Yorkers go to Union Square. And this is where you go and this is where political speeches take place and rallies and demonstrations and you can go and play chess with somebody and you'll lose. Um, but it also has four days a week an incredibly popular farmer's market with 120 vendors and, all, and it operates throughout the year. And um, that brings life and activity. And that's a, another lesson that you learn. If you want to have a really great public space, particularly in an area that's not residential, you have to have all kinds of activities and bring life to that space. And then you don't really need police after that because positive uses drive out negative uses. So this is um, just in New York City. And I, I give you this example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, there are many different kinds of partnerships. So you have on the left, public sector partnerships where the city of New York works with New York State and with the federal government gets government grants and sometimes goes into joint agreements to develop parks. Similar to what you're going to be doing here, you're going to have a national park, you know, part of which will be within the city of Toronto. But you can do very creative things when you work at three levels of government and then do sort of even more creative sort of management structures. 
Then you have your private sector partnerships, usually with for-profit corporations, so the concessions where services are provided by private businesses. Um, public access agreements where developers develop a building, but then also create a park amenity and then, then pay for its maintenance ongoing, which is, that's a very important concept. Corporate sponsorships and adopt a park, and then on the far right, the nonprofit partnerships, where you, that could be anything from a very major contractual relationship that manages the park with a nonprofit to um, a little league, a baseball little league that agrees to maintain the field in exchange for having priority use. And those, you can, you can run the gap from very small and very grassroots to very big and, and, and very, um, with, with great propensity to raise money. So what's the context? As of the figures of two years ago, or three years ago, about $166 million in private fundraising by the nonprofit partnerships, which includes the re earned revenue, but it's mostly just um, charitable giving, uh, people who write checks who care about parks. And then that money is spent on a combination of park maintenance and operations in the red, and then parks programming, and sort of yellow, and then other administration. So that, that money that gets raised gets, gets spent on basic city services. To put that, what's $166 million? Well, it's a little bit, um, it's right around half of the overall operating budget of the city parks department in, in New York, which is similar to um, the, the budget you have here in Toronto. Um, you have a very healthy budget for your parks here in Toronto, but we parks people know it's never enough, right? So there's lots and lots of new parks being built here, so your, your parks general manager would say, yeah, it's a good budget, I'm not complaining, but it could be better. Um, the main virtue, I think, of volunteer parks groups is not the money, and the money is great, but it's the army of volunteers. And in New York, it was, it's about a million and a half hours a year of volunteer labor donated. Here you can see a group in Van Cortland Park uh, planting trees as part of the Million Tree Program. But even more than the labor or the money, you suddenly have this army of engaged citizenry who will, are now, they're now part of a very important block of voters and opinion expressors and people write letters to the editor and go to community board meetings and work with elected officials. And this is what we hope will prevent the parks in New York forever going down to the depths that they cited to before. And then you can have a group like a citywide advocate group, advocacy group, which is probably similar to parks people. This is New Yorkers for parks, uh, whose sole job it is to advocate for parks in New York, and particularly at budget time to remind the mayor and the city council members how important parks are. And you know, every year it seems the parks budget gets cut, and then they get involved and it gets restored. It's what they call the budget dance. But if you don't have these engaged citizens, the budget gets cut, not restored. Just a quick view of concessions. They provide services. They run things like um, the golf courses and marinas and, and tennis operations. But they also invest in the capital upgrades of these facilities. And this shows about uh, $160 million in capital investment in the facilities owned by the public, by the private operators. So that's a, another really important aspect of sort of unconventional management. This model um, started in New York, but quickly ran around the country by 1989, so 35 years ago. The city of Atlanta uh, has a great park that's like the Central Park of Atlanta called Piedmont Park. The Piedmont Park Conservancy was started because this is what the park looked like, an empty swimming pool and overgrown kudzu vine and more of a parking lot than a park. Take a good look at those pictures because in this next video you'll see what those same sites look like today. You have the full pool, the kudzu vine cut back, the um, pavilions were stored and the, the cars were moved from the park and the park returned to the park and so the park is. And so in Atlanta you've got the Piedmont Park Conservancy, in Houston the Herman Park Conservancy, again a lot of befores and afters when the conservancy gets involved. Um, Pittsburgh has a conservancy which takes care of a bunch of parks and has agreements to manage a bunch of, a bunch of parks. I tell you these things to say that you could say, well, New York has a lot of money, corporate headquarters and stuff, but there are many cities in America that don't have a lot of money, that don't have major corporate headquarters, and yet these conservancies play an important role in their lives, including in Buffalo, New York, where the Buffalo Olmsted Parks Conservancy manages two-thirds of the city's park system just across the lake. Um, in Dallas, Texas, a great public-private partnership um, took a terrible scar of a freeway trench in the middle of the city, covered it over with a new park, and is managing this new park that joins the arts district and the residential district. Many of you may have been to Chicago and know this is what 
the area in downtown Chicago looked like about 15 years ago with a sunken parking lot and a train yard, and then they built Millennium Park, a $500 million project, half the money public, half private, but it spurred a remarkable reinvestment in downtown with tens of thousands of people moving to a neighborhood that had, had nobody living in it before, and of course, a great new amenity and a tourist destination and economic development tool. Uh, so, that, so those are some of the advantages. Uh, it's worth highlighting the role of parks in public health. Parks are where people go to get exercise, to get healthy. 50% of all vigorous exercise takes place in public parks. Uh, but they also foster environmental health. Parks do an incredible job of cleaning up the environment, whether it's processing stormwater or cleaning the air. Um, in New York City, a, a plan was developed for a 20-year plan for how the city would grow called Plan YC. And Parks were an essential component of that, including a stated goal by the mayor of saying every New Yorker should uh, live within a 10-minute walk of a park. And uh, as a result of Plan YC, there was a 10 or 15 percent improvement in the number of New Yorkers living within a 10-minute walk of a park. The Million Tree Campaign was launched, and they've planted uh, almost 850,000 trees since the, the campaign was launched in 1987. And then there's the whole issue of sort of re resilience and. Um, that issue was driven home here very recently. Uh, we had some interesting meteorological events in um, uh, <laughs> Well, you probably can't hear. Anyway, this is a, a reporter standing in Battery Park in New York City. Uh, she's up to her knees in water and telling about how everywhere she looks, all she sees is water. And this was during Hurricane Sandy, which is about a year and a half ago now. And that was a real um, eye-opener for us who live on the coast, that these kinds of major weather events we've always feared, not only can they happen, they do happen, and they did happen. And so Hurricane Sandy caused devastation up and down the East Coast, particularly in New York City, where 50 people died and $50 billion worth of damage was done, at the, done in the area. So. This is what Hurricane Sandy looked like coming in to Rockaway Beach. That was a very brave police officer sitting in that truck. <laughs> and this is what Rockaway Beach looked like after the hurricane. Those things you see standing there um, are the remnants of the boardwalk. And the things that are sort of sticking out perpendicular to it are pieces of the boardwalk that get picked up as if there were popsicle stick rafts and plunged into the bay. Many beaches were destroyed. That, that used to be a park there on the waterfront. And um, you know, that's the reality, the new reality. So you don't think about this too much, but parks are a very important part of sustainable design and sustainable cities. And we have to think very much about how we recycle the abandoned urban landscapes. I think you um, may know about the High Line. This was an old elevated freight rail line that became abandoned, and then nature takes over and makes it look really beautiful. Uh, but the city of New York wanted to tear this down because the adjacent property owners said, you know, this is really dragging down the property values. But there were some neighborhood people who said, we have a better idea. Let's turn this into a park in the sky because we have no parks in this you know, growing crowded area. And the High Line was created and a, a beautiful design was evoked. And now is this park in the sky, which um, cost a lot of money to build. It was about $150 million in public money and then a lot of private money. But it's already, there's already been a net gain in new tax collections of $200 million from all the development that came after the development of the highlights. So it provided public amenity and paid for itself. And this kind of thing can, you can see happening around the country. This is our project, the Trust for Public Land in Chicago. It's very similar to the highlights. It's called the Bloomingdale Trail, otherwise known as 606. And then a similar project in, in Queens, New York, another abandoned rail line is being turned into a linear park called the Queensway. Parks are incredibly important for water management. The city of Toronto has mostly a separated sewer system, but it also has parts of it with a combined sewer system where your sanitary sewers, your stormwater sewers get together, and when it rains, you can have terrible flooding, and you can put a, a combination of dirty sewer water and uh, stormwater runoff into, into the lake, which is not good. So we at Trust for Public Land have this educational tool we call Sewer in a Suitcase. And we go to classrooms and teach kids about how um, combined sewer systems work. And then we look at um, their, the schoolyard, the classic New York City schoolyard, which is this big sheet of impermeable asphalt to say, you know, we can do better. We can turn um, this part-time schoolyard into a full-time playground that looks like this. But it also functions as a sponge, that artificial turf, new soccer field there, just a big sponge. 
soaks up stormwater runoff. And each one of these schoolyards can capture half a million gallons of stormwater runoff and help you deal with that really important urban problem. Same thing in Philadelphia. Six acres of asphalt next to a school become a great community playground and then have this added value of being a stormwater capture system, not just for the air, for this immediate playground, but for the whole surrounding area. Uh, in New York City, uh, old traffic islands are being turned into green streets to capture stormwater. This green street during Hurricane Irene captured 30,000 gallons of stormwater in just this one little green area. Uh, and this, there's, no, there's no piece of land too small to, to play this important ecological function, this layered ecological function. This is a street tree bioswale. They're designing street tree planters now to capture 2,000 gallons of stormwater. The water goes in from the street. Uh, this is an innovative idea being tested under two elevated highways um, in New York City, where this a local landscape market that came up with the idea of gathering that nasty water that flows out from the downspouts and just spills into the landscape. And Fido and Bayer are mediating it in, in this they call a hold system that will use plants and soil to clean up the hydrocarbons and the other nasty things that come from highway runoff. And yeah, Los Angeles has 800 miles of alleys. You see the car chases in the movies? Um, they take place in these alleys, and these alleys are hot and impermeable, and they're terrible. Uh, and we're turning them into beautiful green alleys and capture stormwater and reduce the urban heat island and become community amenities. The waterfront of New York that you see today was not always that way. In the 1980s, this is what the Brooklyn waterfront looked like in Dumbo, the abandoned industrial infrastructure of the uh, former maritime commerce. Uh, the old the Bronx River, literally an open sewer, and then transforming these water's edges into beautiful new parks while we're just sort of respecting and retaining, uh, kind of like um, Sugar Beach. So respecting that industrial heritage of your industrial waterfront, but you know, repurposing it as a, as a community park. And um, all, just like many North American cities, uh, New York City was built for commerce. The water was a nasty place where you did business and put all your polluting industries. Those industries went away and left behind brownfields, but those brownfields are now being turned into parks. And the parks are paid for by developers. Developers pay for the parks, as they do here in Toronto, but the additional bonus is that they also pay for their ongoing maintenance, and they have to be open to the public. They, they pay into a maintenance fund that the city uses to hire park workers to keep it maintained. Similar thing happening in Seattle. The Seattle waterfront walled off by a double-decker expressway is being redesigned into the revitalized Seattle waterfront park um, by a great plan by Jim Porter. And they're looking to find some kind of a public partnership to help with this management. So transforming the waterfront as here in New York is a really very important thing, not just because you're transforming this abandoned industrial infrastructure into a great park, but you're using it as part of a natural defense system. A park properly designed along the waterfront can function as a storm surge barrier and buffer, and that's what a lot of cities now have to confront in this era of global climate change. So here's a, a brownfields and a EPA superfund site in Brooklyn, the Gwanis Canal, where a sponge park is being built at the street end to capture, again, that street water runoff. And the best architectural drawing I've ever seen, this is a drawing not showing the layers, the, the geophysical layers, but rather the bureaucratic layers that activists and planners have to confront when dealing with a Superfund site that's regulated by the US EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, the CDP, the state DC. So at least 11 different federal, state, and city agencies that have to sign off on the plans for a thousand square foot little patch of green. So we, you know, we need to do these things. We need to come up with innovative ideas of multifunctional, multi-layered systems. But we also have to reduce the bureaucracy that makes them almost impossible to do. And I say that speaking as a bureaucrat. <laughs> I, that I've learned, having left government, I know just how badly we even knew, I suspected that, how much we tortured our friends. But uh, green infrastructure is a great tool for creating parks. It's, you know, just when you say, oh, there's no money to build parks, you can use green infrastructure. Here's a park in Atlanta, an area that used to flood terribly, and they could have built a huge underground holding tank that no one saw for you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, or build a big, beautiful lake and park that captures that same amount of stormwater. Or here in Newark, a park that the Trust for Public Land built and allowed a Newark residents to get down to the edge of the river for the first time in the city's history on an old ground field next to a Superfund site. A great easy place to work, or Brooklyn Bridge Park, again, the old industrial waterfront. The ultimate act of urban 
landscape alchemy and transformation, taking an old industrial site, turning it into an 80 acre waterfront park, recycling the stone that comes from a tunnel, a new train tunnel, into the hills of this park. Um, you have a park designed by the same Michael Van Valkenburg mm -hmm. designed um, Cork, Cork Town Park. Cork Town Park. It's very much, I was looking at the park yesterday, they're very similar parks. It's a terrific landscape garden thing. But this is the ultimate recycled park. Every drop of water that falls in this park gets reused somehow. It goes for rainwater, stormwater, it gets used for these naturalistic wetlands and for, for, for irrigation tanks and even these beautiful stone steps that people sit on to look at this beautiful Manhattan are from an old bridge that's being taken down elsewhere in the city. They're repurposed here along the benches or the wood from the old coal store storehouse. So that's a trip around America. You have a great city, great city park system, and you're really poised to become the best park city in the whole world, perhaps. Thanks very much. Jane, they're on here to just uh, help out with questions and uh, get the